So the first time I met Josh, it was 7.40 a.m. in a New Testament class at Liberty University. I was sitting there, barely keeping my eyes open, and the professor got done teaching and handed off the microphone to his grad assistant, Josh Allen. And uh, I kind of sat up and, and checked him out a little bit because I started developing a crush on Josh a whole year before we actually met. I started thinking, okay, I'm gonna try to catch his attention. I'm gonna look really cute for class and I'm gonna try to get in line to hand him my Scantron and things like that. And as it turns out, my feminine charms are not as strong at 7.40 a.m. as I thought they were because the whole semester went by and he never noticed me at all. <laughs> and in fact, it wasn't until a year later that we met on Facebook. And uh, when Josh and I finally did meet, we hit it off really quickly. We were, you know, really drawn to each other. We had similar interests and goals, and um, we, we, it was pretty obvious to both of us that we were falling in love. And uh, so Josh was very marriage-minded right from the get-go. Uh, he knew that he was called to preach and pastor, and he knew that he wanted to be married. And I remember just a few weeks into our dating relationship, Josh said, this is how I think it's gonna go. I think we're gonna date for about a year, we're gonna be engaged for six months, and then we're gonna get married. And I was very graceful and nice, and I said, you're nuts, that's not <laughs> happening. Uh, but during the, right before we got engaged, Josh had actually been called to take a church in Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is a small town pretty close to the border out in New Mexico. We got engaged, and just a day or two later, Josh moved out to New Mexico to pastor that church and I stayed behind in Baltimore. And during that time, I started getting really nervous about getting married. I was like, you know, a little bit worried about the commitment and what would happen. And I called Josh and I'd be like, what if, we, you know, what if we do this and what if there's a problem? And he was very patient and kind. And he actually wrote me a hundred letters for the last 100 days of our engagement to convince me to marry him. And they all had different topics. They all you know, said different things, but the overarching theme was always the same. It was, I love you, don't worry, because we're gonna be together soon, and we're gonna have this amazing life serving Christ together. And of course, that won me over, and I got married to him in August of 2010, and I moved out to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where I became not just a wife, but also a pastor's wife, which is a very blessed, but very challenging job. Uh, but we had a great church, it was very small, only about 18 people, People, and God really grew, uh, stretched us and grew us while we were out there. And then we had our son Josiah in May 2013, and I fell in love with Josh all over again, watching him become a dad. Even from the first week of Josiah's life, Josh would hold him out in one arm and he would say, I love you and I'm proud of you. And I was sleep deprived and I would just be like, what are you proud of him for? He didn't do anything but cry and poop all day. But Josh was just such a great dad right from the get go and he loved it. And you know, God was just growing us together as a family. It was a great season in our life until February 24th of 2014. It was just a really normal day. Uh, Josiah was about eight months old at that time, so we were playing with him and watching him try to learn how to crawl. Um, we had meatloaf and mashed potatoes for dinner and watched Netflix. It was just a very nice evening together. Um, Josh went to go pick up his twin brother from the airport in El Paso, which was only about a half an hour from our house. And as I was putting Josiah to bed, I got this phone call that he wasn't at the airport. And I didn't worry at first, I thought he might have gotten stuck in traffic, but he wasn't answering his phone or any texts. I started this hours long process of calling um, hospitals, police stations, fire departments, just everybody I could to try to find out some kind of information. Uh, it wasn't until the wee hours of that morning, which was actually the morning of my 26th birthday, that. Uh, I finally got a hold of someone at a police station who told me, just watch the news. If something happened, you'll see it there. And I hadn't thought of it, and so I ran over to go turn on the news, and I got a phone call from my dad, who had been watching the news. I would called and asked them to pray, and he'd been watching the news, and he said, I need to know what kind of a car you drive. And I told him, and he just started sobbing, and he said, I can't tell you. And I said, Dad, you have to tell me. And he said, there's been an accident involving that car 
It had an empty car seat in it and the driver is dead. And as it turned out, a drunk driver had come down the wrong side of the interstate really fast, uh, hit Josh head on, and both that driver and Josh were killed in that accident. And I don't really remember a lot of the things that night. I remember being hysterical and obviously crying, but I remember that there was one point where I went into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I thought, this can't be right. I'm 26 years old today and I'm nursing an infant. I can't be a widow. And it just felt so unreal. And I just saw my whole world falling away from me in that moment. As I looked around our house and I saw all of the things that we had and, and things from our wedding and things from when Josiah was a baby. And I just looked around and I knew that everything was about to change and my whole life was just torn apart. I got through the next week somehow and I got through the funeral, which a lot of people from Las Cruces came to, and Josh's dad actually preached his funeral, did an amazing job. And then I got on a plane, and I left New Mexico to go live with my family in Maryland to get help with Josiah. And I had my life pretty much the way I wanted it in New Mexico. But I watched that whole world fall away as I took off, and when I landed in Maryland, I had no home, no job, no church, no car, none of the friends that I'd had for the last three and a half years. I had uh, no money in my bank account. I was $50,000 in student loan debt, and I had no husband. I remember the night that the shock wore off. I saw a picture of Josh and me that I had never seen before. I handed Josiah to my mom, and I went out to the front steps of her house, and I looked up at the sky, and I just prayed, God, you have to fix this. I don't care if you run me over with a car or hit me with a bolt of lightning. I can't make my son an orphan, but I need you to do that because this hurts too much. I can't live here without him. This can't be my life. And I was just utterly broken. And I, um, I remember being angry at God when I woke up the next morning because I really hoped that he would just take me out of the world so I could go be with him and be with Josh. Every morning for a long time I was really angry at God and I, I was so mad that he just kept waking me up and I would go on these long walks where I would just rant at God and I would just yell at him and I was just really so upset about how my life was now. But you know, the amazing thing about God is that I was asking him to destroy my life. And instead, he was in the process of restoring it. Um, just a couple of days after the accident, I had a cousin who set up a uh, fund for me through their nonprofit ministry. And I was really just hoping to get enough to cover the funeral and the travel costs. Within just a few months, more than $120,000 was donated to me and Josiah through individuals and churches and money just kept pouring in and it was so incredible to see and I knew that it was God because there were people not only were there churches who we knew who donated to us and people we knew and family members there were people who didn't know me or Josh or our families that still donated to us in fact there were people who said I'm not even a Christian. I don't even believe in God. But something deep inside told me to give you this money when I heard about your situation. And there was one woman in particular who gave thousands of dollars to the point that my cousin actually called her and said, are you sure you didn't add a zero here? Are you sure you want to do this? And this woman said, I've had this money sitting aside in an account for months and I kept trying to give it away and God said no, no, no and she said when I heard about that situation God said give it to her and it was such a blessing I was able to purchase a car I was able to put a down payment on a home for me and Josiah um, I was able to re-enroll at Liberty University they actually gave me a 50% scholarship to re-enroll there and I was able to pay the other 50% with the money that was donated to me and I was able to actually graduate in 2016 with my master's degree from Liberty and um, everything just 
it was amazing to see God provide. And as I went through the Bible, I started looking for a lot of references to widows in the Bible because obviously this became something I wanted to know how God felt about widows. And so I started looking for all these references and it talked about God being a provider for the widow and being a protector of the widow and the fatherless and uh, about how he would be the husband to the widow. And I saw God do this in this very real and tangible way. And, um, you know, God led us to a church family. For a long time, we didn't have a church family. It took years to find a place where I felt really comfortable um, because obviously I felt very different from other people my age and people around me. And I got settled in at a church finally, and it meant the world to have a church family again. I was able to plug in to do some ministry. Um, you know, God just really came through in so many ways. I was able to pay off all my debt. But even with all of that, even as I saw God just bless and bless and bless, I was still so heartbroken. People don't understand grief. They think that it's just this quick process and they think it's very clean and you go through a year and then you're fine. But it, it's not like that at all. It's really complex and difficult and impossible to even explain really. But I was so broken, even as I saw God working and helping us. And there were still so many nights that I would just get through the whole day with Josiah, who was, you know, very young. I would get through the day with him. I would put him to bed and then I would just lay on the floor and I would just sob for hours until my body was just completely exhausted and I didn't have any more tears left to cry. I was just so heartbroken and God really healed my heart in two major ways. The first way was through his presence because even though I would never volunteer to go through this, um, obviously no one wants to suffer, I was able to experience the presence of God in this most profound way, this way that I never had experienced it before and I never would have if I didn't have to go through this time of suffering. I would, it would be in those moments where I was laying there just crying and empty and I didn't even feel like I could go on to the next breath. That's where I would find Christ in the most real way. Like I knew that if I just opened my eyes, he was right there next to me. I knew if I just reached out my hand, he would be there. I felt his presence in a way that I never had before. And, and it just made me think of how the Bible says that God is close to the brokenhearted and to people who are crushed in spirit. And I was crushed in spirit. And I knew that God was there with me. I also, I also would go through these nightmares at that time, which were, Every single night, Josh would die in my dreams over and over again, and I felt like I was living this living nightmare because all day long would be such a struggle and I just wanted the day to end. And then I would go to sleep at night and I would dream about Josh dying. And I would also have this recurring dream that I was drowning. And this would happen over and over again. In my dreams, I would always be drowning, but I would hold Josiah over my head, trying to get him out of the water and protect him. And I would wake up with these panic attacks every day to the point that I almost couldn't breathe. And it was just, it was so difficult. And this was even a year and more after everything happened. And it was a process. It wasn't something that just fixed itself overnight. But God slowly, gradually healed my heart. And God also healed my heart through the writings of Josh. You see, I have a hundred letters from Josh that say, I love you. Don't worry, because we're going to be together soon, and we're going to have an amazing life serving Christ together. And those letters were written from New Mexico, but they might as well have been written from heaven. And I have a hundred letters now to show Josiah one day to say, this is how you love your wife. And I would read those, and I would carry them in my pocket, and I would read them until they were all crumpled, and the tears would make all of the ink run. And some of them you can't even read anymore, but they got me through. And the other thing that Josh did was that he was preaching a sermon series through the book of Philippians about having joy in suffering. And that was at the time of his death, he was preaching that. And I was like, 
Josh, don't preach about suffering, okay? Like you preach about finances and we don't have any money, okay? You preach about marriage and we fight. Like don't preach about suffering, okay? But he was like, no, God told me I had to preach this about joy and suffering. And he didn't know that he was preaching about this for me. And he was writing these letters to the church and these sermons. And those would be the sermons and the letters that would get his wife through his own death. And the very last thing that he ever wrote was a letter about Philippians chapter one. And he wrote it to the church. And the last line of that letter was, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he signed it, Pastor Josh. And as far as I know, that's the last sentence he ever wrote on earth. And he was gone just a few days later. And I just, I could see that God knew that this was going to happen. And as much as I hated that, I also knew that it, it had to be part of his plan. And, um, and so I was able to see God use those situations and those things he was preparing me for long in advance to get me through that time. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like a, a cheesy Christian movie where everything just came together all at once. It was hard and some days it's still hard, honestly. Um, I still cry sometimes when I think about Josh and when I miss him, but God has restored so much to me. And uh, in fact, I just got married last August. Uh, I met my husband Phil on Christian Mingle last January, so a little over a year and a half ago. I, we had a 15 minute phone conversation. We texted for a while and we said, okay, let's talk on the phone for 15 minutes. And four and a half hours later, I hung up the phone with him and I said, I'm gonna marry that man after one phone conversation. I knew it right from the beginning. God gave me so much peace. And we got married uh, just about six months later. And um, it's been amazing. You know, Josiah is a happy, healthy kid and he loves having a dad. He says now, Josiah says now that he has a dad in heaven and he has a dad on earth and he still asks a lot of questions about his dad in heaven, um, but he's very thankful to have a dad now who can play with him also. And I have actually gained a stepson who's five years old, Liam, and we are this family unit now. And I honestly could not have asked for as as good of a life as I have right now, I couldn't have imagined it. I would have never thought to even ask for a sibling that was right next to Josiah's age. I would have never thought to ask for a man who loves the Lord and who loves me the way that Phil does uh, because he always amazes me with it. And God has just has just shown us that there is a plan and you know for a long time after the accident I would think about that verse Romans 8 28 that God works all things together for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose and at the time it didn't make any sense to me because I would think this isn't good you know this is this is not good that I don't have a husband and that Josiah doesn't have a dad and I would get so angry at God about that because I would say this is not good and you know it's true that was awful there was nothing good about that situation and I can't look at it and say oh well this was all just you know it all ended up for good because those are truly things that God used for good but that won't be restored until we get to heaven. And uh, But I have seen God working good in my life still. And I know that he hasn't given up on us. And I truly never thought I would really smile again. I never thought I would be happy again. I, I thought that that was my life. And I have to say that I'm happier now than I ever thought I would be again. And I'm so thankful that God didn't give up on us. And there is uh, one quote that I wanted to share because I found it recently. It's by Elizabeth Elliot, who was also a widow. And she said, of one thing I am perfectly sure, God's story never ends in ashes. And that I've seen in my life that God, he sometimes allows these things to happen, but he does use them for his glory and he never lets go of us even when we let go of him. If you're going through a time of grief, just never stop praying, even if it means that you're yelling at God and that you're raging at God, or you feel like you're saying the wrong words, or you feel like you're saying, if you're saying nothing and you're just sitting there. I remember there were so many times that I would just sit there and 
I wanted to pray, but I didn't have any words to pray. And I would just sit there with God and cry. And I knew that He was with me in that. And so my encouragement would just be to keep praying. And no matter what you say, just keep praying all the time. That's There's really nothing that I feel like I did to, like, sorry. People will say to me sometimes, oh, you're so strong that you got through that and you were able to do this and that. And I really look back and I don't feel like there's a lot that I did to get through that. That was all God working um, in my life. The only thing that I can say that I did was just sit there and, and pray and uh, cry to God and yell at God and give God every single one of those things. And um you know, that was pretty much all that I was able to do. Also, don't get a bull mastiff puppy. Because <laughs> <laughs> in my grief fog, I decided to go get a bull mastiff puppy with no pre-planning and no crate and new Ikea furniture. <laughs> the main thing when I talk to people who are grieving now, because I do have friends that reach out to me when they go through something like that, I tell them, there is another side that one day you are going to really be happy again. You're really going to smile again, that God hasn't given up on you. But I know you can't see it right now, so just let yourself feel the pain and just let yourself experience it and know that you're not going to be able to see the end, the end of this plan, that God does have uh, something still planned for you and He is not, your life is not over, that, you know, God still is working even when you can't see it and when it doesn't feel like it, God is still there and he's still working.